This program is sponsored by Mouse Mesh. Mice get into your home via the air bricks. Mouse Mesh is a humane alternative to preventing mice and other unwanted guests from entering your home. Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. It really is difficult to keep up with all of the alleged carnage being reported in mainstream media recently. My advice is don't believe any of it unless you are 100% sure you have seen solid evidence of every single claim. I communicated with Neil Sanders recently and he has reported on a GCHQ policy which sets out a strategy to plant false stories on the internet with the aim of misleading researchers. In other words, your government is using your taxes to mislead you. Now, today I am launching a new film on DVD which can be pre-ordered from the website for dispatch on the 8th of August 2016. Unfortunately, I cannot say what the film is about. What I can say is it is 93 minutes long, it is not a new Madeline film, and it is not about UFOs, but that really is all I can say. All will become clear when you watch it. So if you want to order the mystery film for Dispatch on the 8th of August, please follow this link. All will be revealed then. As many viewers know, I have researched the Mars Rover program with a very critical eye and I conclude that the evidence does not convince me that the Mars rovers are on Mars. I suspect they may have never left the Earth. I recently spent some time updating my hypothesis document, which is now some 100 pages long. On today's show, I discuss the new hypothesis with Andrew Johnson. The jury is very much still out on this one. Warning. This show has quite a high nerd rating, but that's okay because I suspect there are many rich planet viewers who might be described as closet nerds. We've discussed some of NASA's projects at length on Rich Planet in previous shows, including the Mars Rover program. These are unmanned robots which, according to NASA, are roaming around the surface of Mars and occasionally sending back pictures. In 2014, I published a paper entitled The Mars Rover Hypothesis, which examines whether or not the Mars rovers really are on Mars and evidence suggesting they possibly never left the Earth. I have recently updated the hypothesis with significant new evidence, and here to discuss the work is Rich Planet stalwart Andrew Johnson. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for inviting me, Richard. Now then, um, when I put this hypothesis out and people can see our interviews um, from these links on the screen and they can download the new hypothesis from the link on the screen. Uh, I was contacted by uh, two scientists and they went through a lot of the evidence in the document and they mm. were casting doubt over a lot of the evidence. Mm. Uh, um, so what, what we're going to do first is just look at some of the evidence that we put forward or I put forward. Uh, also to mention Douglas Gibson, he's, yes. he's been involved in this research as well. Uh, that we think now is, is probably not so strong or has been taken out of the hypothesis altogether. Because yeah. I've listed some of the evidence that's been removed from the hypothesis because um, it's effectively been explained. The first um, was the, the moving artifacts um, image. This was a, a photograph, we can see it here in, in, in the image, where it appeared that some of the rocks were in different positions in different images. and it was shown fairly easily that this was just due to parallax, a parallax yep. problem with, with yep. the camera. Uh, the other piece of evidence which I've completely removed from the hypothesis was an image called the self-portrait of curiosity. Yes. And this is because it, th the image, it does seem to have been uh, stitched together from a, a mosaic of lots of other images. Yes. So it w 
what was suggested was, well, how, how could something possibly take a photograph of itself? Yes. Um, now, perhaps still in the ambiguous category, but I've, I've moved these uh, two images uh, to, the, to the appendix. So they're not part of the main hypothesis, but I've left them in there. The first one is, is the piece of wood image, which uh, I know that you're familiar with. Yes, indeed. So if you'd just remind us about that image, uh, Andrew. Yes, well, I mean, when I first saw this image a few years ago, it did, to me, look like a, a plank of wood, basically, that had, that had kind of partly rotted. Uh, and that was primarily because of its shape and the texture of it and the length of it. And it did seem to have squared off edges. But I think um, from what you'd put in the document there, there are some additional segments of that same image, just I think a few few sort of feet away, yeah. aren't there, where yeah. you're seeing similar uh, features. Yeah, so we see there a much wider image of the landscape where there appears to be other objects which have the same surface texture. Yes. Right, to the right there, which, which isn't the same shape with squared off edges. So right, so it could just be that it's happened to be a, a lump of rock that's broken off of that you know, which looks like a, a three by two lump of wood. But, uh, but again, you know, what we can say is that we know that these rover images are capable of taking color pictures. And, you know, this discussion that we're having now would have been aided by having a color mm -hmm. picture because then, you know, if it were, we could see whether it was wood colored mm -hmm. or whether it was less wood colored. But we can't because it's only black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, another image which I've taken out of the main hypothesis and moved into the appendix, but still in the document, uh, is was what we've termed the walrus arm bone, which a close-up, we'll just put that on the screen, looks at first sight very much like a bone. Uh, again, uh, one of the scientists that contacted me actually did a, a calculation on the size, and he pointed out quite rightly that one of the first things you should try and do is ascertain what is the size of the thing that you're looking yes, at. Yes, indeed, yeah. And, um, he did that by looking at the um, imprints of the tires, whether well, they're not tires, the, the wheels. The wheels, of, yeah. With uh, the of the rover. Yeah. Uh, 75 millimeters, as we see there. So the, 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 the item in the image there is probably, maybe, I would say, less than seven and a half centimeters long. So it's, it's you know, it's not, it's, it's not, not big it's enough for a, for to a be leg a, joint. To be a, a leg, uh, yeah, a, a walrus. So, mm. Uh, and he actually said in his in his um, in his text, and don't even go down the avenue of calling it a baby seal bone, right? <laughs> but if we look at a wider shot of that, I think I'm inclined to accept this: that uh, there are lots of fragments of rocks of all different kinds of random shapes, and they clearly are rocks in that in that image. So I'm I'm happy to accept that that may just be a rock and not mm. not a bone. Uh, so as I say, that's th they've been moved into the into the appendix. There's many many changes to this document. Um, some of it as a result of the uh, the information given to me by these two scientists. Um, I've, I've added some new sections into the hypothesis, uh, Andrew. Uh, mm. I'll just run through them: uh, microbial life images, vent yep. facts, and unexplained features, uh, sand dunes, uh, lidar radio signals and um, the landing. Another thing that I've taken out is I was comparing the Spirit and Opportunity rovers with um, uh, mobility called, scooter. a mobility scooter. And it was pointed out that, well, mobility scooters are designed to travel several miles in one charge, uh, yes. whereas th the rover will only go a few meters. It, it yeah. mo moves very short distances. Um, now. There's a lot of hardware on these rovers, and if you would operate them all simultaneously, it would be quite a load. But I understand that it's done in a very conservative fashion. So the amount of uh, current or power that uh, the devices draw, including the motors on the wheels, is very small relative to a mobility scooter. So they're yes. saying it's not a fair comparison. Yeah. So I've taken that comparison out. But I, I do still ask questions about whether the lithium ion batteries that are on spirit and opportunity could have really lasted for 10 years with, w w without um, having significant reduction in performance. Yes, indeed. And I mean, we can, you know, point out that the conditions on Mars, uh, according to what we're told, you know, rather more hostile to battery technology than mm. they are on Earth. So, 
you know, it, a, a laptop battery, as you say, lasting 10 years on Earth. I mean, a laptop battery doesn't, a laptop doesn't draw that much current. So, you know, but yet a laptop will only last for five minutes when the battery is, you know, basically no good, no good. Mm -hmm. um, so how are these, how are these lasting on a charge from solar panels, which are, you know, that much further away from the sun, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we come to another photographic image, which is uh, PIA 16204. And as soon as you see this image, you think, well, that's some kind of rodent. It's a, a lemming or it's what have you. Now, both the scientists said that they thought it was uh, just a rock that did caught the light in a certain way to make it look like that. Now, interestingly, one of these scientists was able to give me another um, uh, high definition image of that group of rock, rocks on a different day, about three weeks apart uh, from a different angle. And obviously, if it's a rodent, it's not gonna be there in this other image, so it should be completely absent. Now, so I've included uh, that image in the new hypothesis. Now, it's not that straightforward because initially, this scientist, he, he actually got, he, I, I believe he misidentified the rocks, which I put in one of my previous lectures. Uh, and I, th th this is the correct identification, I believe, um, wh which is shown in these two drawings. Um, so we've, the, imp the important rocks are rocks one, two, and three, and the, um, the anomaly is between rocks number two and three. So yes. if we just look at this close-up image of them side by side. Um, yes, and I mean, as you said in your uh, lecture, Richard, that you do have to look at this carefully and, you know, I was looking at this in your document when I was going through it a few days ago. And I was probably looking at the, this pair of images for uh, something like 10 minutes to, com to sort of, so I could orientate what was being illustrated in my own mind to, you know, so it's not something you can just do instantly. Mm -hmm. Because, as, 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 you know, we've already said, these images were taken days apart. The rover's in a slightly different position. The light's different. The size of the rocks in each image is, is somewhat different. So you do have to look at the rock field fairly carefully and kind of do a bit of 3D space, you know, um, mm. analysis in your brain to, to work out what is being shown. Mm. So in the image there, rock two is marked. That's the same rock in each image from a different angle at a different day and also rock three. So the, 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 inqu the question we must ask, it appears that there is sand banked up on rock number three. Is that sand, or is it actually the back of another rock, which is making up the rock that we see in the middle, or the, the anomaly that we see in the middle, which, which looks like a rodent? Um, now, if, if you look along the profile here, the sand does seem to follow, or rock if it's a rock, the same profile as some kind of rodent. But um, is, is that that? Is that what we're looking at? Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, uh, do you make a judgment, Andrew? Well, I mean, I, I was, when I looked at this, and I said I did look at it for a number of minutes, and it, you know, it does look like that rock, which is meant to be a rodent, has moved out of the way. I'd like to, to, to make me comfortable, more comfortable in my own mind, I'd like to see some, some sort of computer model made but that would probably take a couple of weeks of work, at least. Mm -hmm. I think I think it'd probably be possible to do it from these from these images, and maybe there might be another one that could be added in. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a complicated process. Um, but but I, I would like to see that done before I was I was convinced. But uh, but but before I was hundred percent convinced. But looking at the two images we have, I'd say yes, it does look like the the alleged rodent does seem to be not present in the in the right. second image. Right. And there is another more conspiratorial angle which may have happened that I suggest in the document, and that is that the, the first image there on the left has been released. The NASA or whoever have realized they haven't airbrushed it out. So they've, they've deliberately taken a, uh, an image from another angle and they've, they've, they've made the sand look like um, this, this, a similar shape mm. To, mm. to create ambiguity. Mm. Now that might sound very contrived and perhaps it is but I just put it in there as a possibility. Yeah. Yes. Um, but if, if, if it can be proven that the anomaly, which looks like a rodent on the left, definitely isn't in the second image, that, uh, to me, that's fairly smoke and gun evidence. But as you say, a 3D model would be, would be useful.
Yes. All right. So if we've got any volunteers out there, then be our guest and yes. uh, s see what you can come up with. Yeah. Uh, now the next image, which um, uh, the uh, well, one of the scientists said was just geology. That these um, what were what I asserted might be some sort of um, vertebrae from a creature. Uh, it does look like a vertebrae, but um, one of the points that was noted was, well, if that's a vertebrae, what's the um, object at the very left of the screen there? If if what's on the right of the screen mm. is is some sort of vertebrae, then is what's on the left of the screen also the remains of some animal? And if it is, what, what is it? Um, because I think he was saying, well, what's on the left there is geology, so why isn't what's on the right geology? And he also points to a wider image. This that, one. I mean, that argument there is somewhat weak, if you ask me, because uh, if that is some type of fossilised uh, animal, then it may, parts of, part of it may have been washed away, you know, in a, uh, some, you know, mm. some river, or it could have been moved by some other process, which has happened, wind erosion, or the rock has just, you know, split apart and fallen on top of it. You know, so, so saying that that bit looks like a bone and that bit next to it doesn't, you know, therefore the whole thing isn't, is mm. it, to me, would be a weak argument. Yeah. Well, wh what he said is that the whole thing is geology and it's been made th um, by the process of, uh, well, wind erosion and the creation of what they call ventifacts, which, okay. which I'm, we're going to we'll come on to. That, yeah. um, and there's, there's an image of a, of a ventifact um, in, the, in the Arctic. Sorry, yes, and I mean, you can, you know, that almost looks like some type of skull, doesn't it, from, yeah. from that angle. So, yes, you can, see, you can see the point. But then again, you know, we get onto the whole argument of if the uh, atmospheric density on Mars is what is alleged to have been, there is some yeah. question as to how, m how much erosive force would be produced by such an atmosphere, you know. Yeah, so yeah. And how much sand can that atmosphere, atmosphere carry? Support, yeah, in, in, in the in the lower gravity, you know, maybe can it support more because it's lower gravity, you know, and uh, the atmospheric pressure is that much lower. You know, we don't have, I don't know, maybe there are some scientific papers on that mm. which we haven't. I and mean, if anybody can find those and wants to send them to us, great. You know, if it gives us more information, fantastic. Okay, the next image is something that uh, Douglas Gibson pointed out which appears to show two um, egg-shaped objects which have perhaps been broken. And the question is, are we looking at two eggshells um, from eggs which have perhaps hatched open? Possibly. Yeah, I looked at this image and I felt that the what was alleged to be shells looked a bit too thick to me. Um, I certainly think the way that the sand has kind of sat in them is quite interesting. Um, but, but another thought that came to my mind when looking at that particular image is if they were just fresh egg cells, they would have, you know, and they were organic matter, they would have decayed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that fossilized egg shells are quite rare. They, you know, they don't find many of them. Um, so I don't know, maybe there's another explanation for this image, but the image itself is, is still quite interesting. All right. And you would normally find eggshells in groups of two or three. Where we've got two there and it, they certainly look elliptical in shape rather than round yes. or... Uh, and it appears that in the top one that part of the object, whatever it is, is broken off. The broken piece appears to be lying beside it. Yes. Which you is know, what a hatched egg might look like. Yes, but I mean, I, w I would argue that it might have been an egg-shaped object, you know, uh, yeah. so that, that was an, an inorganic object perhaps. You know, which we, we seem to have several examples of uh, in other images. And Douglas Gibson has done a calculation of the size on that particular object, and he, he reckons it's about just over four centimetres in length, which he's saying is consistent with certain types of eggs. Yes. Now, this is an image which was in the, in the previous hypothesis, which was alleged uh, to look like uh, lichen, mm. which, which is this sort of fungus type stuff which grows on rocks. Yes. Uh, now, what uh, one of the scientists points out here is that if you look at that image there, you've got um, quite a regular circle around the central um, anomaly, and then further out, you've got another circle. And what that's created by is an instrument on the Mars rover called um, the Mossbauer spectrometer. So this is a, a metal plate with a hole in it, a circular metal plate, which pushes down onto the surface, and it leaves the central 
piece in place. Uh, that has then been photographed at a later time by the microscopic imager. So you're not so the regular the regular sh circular shape there has been made by the rover itself. Right. right. So really, all you're interested in is the pattern, not the fact that it's grown in a or appears to have grown in a circular way. Yeah. Okay. So you can ignore that. So you're just looking at the surface texture, and what the um, the, the scientist said was that well, that's just the surface texture of of, of, of rock or sand or soil or something like that. All right. Yes. So yes. He, he, he's certain that he's explained what that image is, but he admits that it, it does look a bit like lichen. Okay, but I've left it in there in the hypothesis there because um, I still think it's strong enough to be left in. Yes, I would agree with you. I think that does it does look like lichen. The pattern of the sort of um, you know the little individual strands or tendrils or whatever you would call them with lichen does match the uh, the terrestrial image. Right, now the next um, section I've added, uh, which is evidence of microbial life. Now people might say, well, this doesn't suggest that the rovers are uh, not, uh, the, are on the Earth because there might be microbial life on Mars. It might be suggesting that there is a microbial life on Mars, and um, I'm open to that. Um, now, I've mentioned the uh, labelled release experiment mm. Um, no, you know a little bit about that, Andrew. Just tell us about that. Yeah, well, this was this experiment uh, that, was, that was designed by, by Dr. Gilbert Levin, and it was flown, or allegedly flown, on the Viking 1 and 2 missions. And basically what it did was there, were, there was a mechanical arm dug into the soil on Mars, uh, drew, drew back the soil into the lander, deposited the dust in some type of uh, dish, um, which was actually had some, I think, some sugars uh, in, a, in a sugary solution. And um, the sugar was laced with radioactive carbon, that's carbon-14. And the experiment was that if there were any bacteria in this dust, that they should metabolize the sugars in this solution. And then they would give off carbon dioxide. But because this, uh, because this, uh, you know, these sugars were radioactively doped with carbon-14, then the radioactive detector would detect radioactive carbon dioxide. Mm. And indeed, th this experiment did detect radioactive carbon dioxide being given off. So the only way that could happen was by the sugary solution being metabolized by uh, bacteria mm. in, in the soil. And on both of the landers, it, it produced the same result for the first two experiments. And then, strangely, in later experiments, it didn't. Yes, indeed. And there were, you know, there were other experiments, such as the pyrolytic release, um, which uh, David Darling has, has gone and done a good description of, um, that which also produced a positive uh, you know, result for microbial life. Right. And then there was a third experiment, which was the, I forget the name of this third experiment, which I think it was some type of gas chromatogram or something. And that, that produced a negative result. But mm. according to what David Darling said in his, one of his uh, talks, uh, they, they knew that that experiment didn't work even before it got to Mars because they tested it on Earth. And even on Earth, mm. it had failed to detect. So we think then that wherever the Viking landers were, there probably was microbes in the soil. C I would uh, say you yes. You would say that, yeah. Yes. Uh, now, later lander, the Phoenix lander, took images which um, have been put into a sequence of, of the soil, and they appear to show little mites or something crawling about. Correct, yeah, very, very that. interesting, that one. And I've shown this at a few of the talks I've given. You know, people have seen those will might remember that. And Ron Bennett, he did a, a very interesting sort of experiment of his own in that he put a lot of these images from the Phoenix la lander into a time-lapse sequence. Mm. So he was able to see this apparent movement of these particles, or, or and, and, it, and it, it is... It does seem to be consistent with the speed and the type of movement that a small, uh, you know, bug um, mm. made. And he, he got that. He was interviewed on CNN, this Ron Bennett mm. chap, but he didn't work for NASA. He was an amateur researcher. Mm. So, again, why weren't NASA making their own time lapse mm. videos? You know, it's now, very strange. What I've said in the hypothesis um, is R Ron Bennett, because uh, Mars has such a hostile environment, which only certain types of life 
similar to life on Earth would be able to survive. So it has to be very hardy life yes. that's going to survive on Mars that we're going to find. So he suggests that it's, it's perhaps one of these tardigrades, which they've, they've tested in um, zero gravity and this kind of thing, and they've, they've, they've got this extremely um, robust design whereby they can withstand extreme temperatures and very little oxygen and all this sort of stuff. So this is why he's plumped for that, and possibly also the shape of it. Yes. But um, discuss this with Douglas Gibson, yeah. and he says, well, there's a whole load of there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different types of soil mites, right, which could also be in that image yes. and are far more common on the Earth. So is this not just a very, very common soil mite found on the Earth rather than the exotic tardigrade suggested by the other chap who believes the craft is on, on Mars? Mars indeed, so yes. if, you, if you bring the craft to the Earth, there's a far more simple explanation for that evidence. That's what we're suggesting. Right, right, right. And it's worth mentioning that the Phoenix lander was only functioning, I think, for about six months before they lost contact with it. Mm -hmm. So that, again, uh, is rather, you know, um, well, fortunate or unfortunate, depending mm -hmm. on which uh, way you looked at it. This program is sponsored by Mouse Mesh. Mice can squeeze through gaps the thickness of a pencil. This simple, effective solution will not only prevent mice, it's also a barrier against wasps, bees and slugs.